with the International Society for Biblical Hermeneutics. We are having a webinar today on the topic of creationism. Uh, Zachary Klein, who is an independent researcher and a creation speaker for the Missouri Association for Creation, is speaking with us today. He has just done one topic on understanding the geological column. If you haven't seen that one yet, I'd recommend watching it before we get into this one, which is understanding the fossil record. Very much related ideas. Zachary, thank you so much for joining us. Take it away. Thank you, Paul. Can you see my slides? Everything good? Looks great. All right. Let's do this thing. So oh, I'll just jump right in. This is my second slide. That's OK. Uh, what is the fossil record? So th this talk is really just the second part of my first presentation. I divide it into two with two different emphases. So yes, as Paul said, it's very helpful if you've already seen the last presentation. I'm going to be uh, building off of this idea that we have a geologic column uh, that represents in a relatively reliable way the relative order and age of, of the Earth's rocks. And within those rocks, most of them, we find more than just rocks. We find fossils. We find the remains of animals and plants, just various types of organisms, uh, many of which we don't have today, like the dinosaurs and the trilobites uh, and others. And these fossils are have long intrigued uh, human beings. We've, we've noticed these things for a long time. There were some speculative ideas about how you ever got animal bones into rock in the first place. And one gentleman I want to talk about who is really important in understanding how the fossil record came to be is a, a French naturalist by the name of Georges Cuvier. He is a founding father of paleontology. Uh, also, I want to point out, just as with Nicholas Steno, he predates Charles Darwin. So we don't need to assume evolution is at work here as we uh, look at the history of the fossil record. In fact, Cuvier was a catastrophist. He was an opponent of evolution, not Darwin's evolution, but earlier ideas of evolution by Lamarck and others. And Cuvier opposed those. And he opposed them in part because of what he saw in the fossil record, which is very significant. But Cuvier helped to establish the principle of faunal succession, which is similar to what we saw with the geologic column that different types of rocks show up at different uh, levels in the Earth's uh, surface. Uh, fossils do something very similar. Certain types of fossils show up in a layer and they might persist for a few layers and then they disappear. And Cuvier recognized that as evidence of extinction. Now, even though he was a catastrophist, uh, unlike Steno, he did not interpret the entirety of what he saw from a biblical perspective. He was a catastrophist. He believed the Bible uh, in, in as much that he believed the last big catastrophe was Noah's flood. But he believed there were other catastrophes worldwide that affected the Earth and that were resulting in these extinctions and these this faunal succession that he saw in the rocks. Uh, this is a few uh, diagrams from uh, one of his uh, surveys of the geology and the fossils around Paris, France. And what Cuvier recognized, and other paleontologists as well, that there was a distinctive order in which various types of fossils were found. This should sound kind of similar. It's very similar to what Steno and others were recognizing from the rock record. Now, this order was explained by Cuvier as evidence of repeated catastrophes resulting in extinctions. And that was controversial at the time. Uh, even among uniformitarians, extinction was initially very controversial because uh, uniformitarian, present is the key of the past, extinction kind of runs against the grain of that idea, even though today it's, it's widely accepted. Uh, Cuvier argued that the abrupt appearance of different types of animals in the fossil record was evidence against evolution. He did not see that seamless transition of animal forms, organism forms, through the fossil record. Instead, he saw fully, com fully uh, cohesive animals that just show up without any seeming, uh, seemingly direct uh, uh, lineage to explain how they came to be. Uh, this is a quote from one of his papers in 1796. Uh, he says, all of these facts, he's writing about uh, fossil elephants, actually, in this paper, uh, among themselves and not opposed by any report. So he's saying no contrary evidence to this regard, uh, seem to me to prove the existence of a world previous to ours destroyed by some kind of catastrophe. That is very significant. That's the kind of language that we as creationists, we like to, to hear, we like to use. Uh, the idea that the world that then was perished, as the Bible says. Uh, and Cuvier was seeing evidence of that, even though he didn't interpret it 
consistently in a biblical fashion. Uh, again, the fossil record today is almost consistently taught in terms of evolution. And so as the scientific consensus moved towards uniformitarianism and towards Darwin, a final succession just became equated with the idea of biological evolution. The reason why certain animals were found at a lower level is because they evolved first. And the animals that were found above that level uh, must have evolved from the ones beneath. And so it became just kind of uh, a, a sort of uh, paleontological dogma that faunal succession is evidence of evolution. And yet it was discovered before evolution. And it, those who discovered it, at least in the case of Cuvier, saw it as evidence against evolution. So that's important. Now, I want to talk, like I did last time, I want to talk about a, a statement that gets made by creationists. Again, not technically wrong, but not always very helpful. That is the issue of missing links. We love talking about missing links, the idea that uh, there are these gaps between organisms and there's no, no animal that bridges those gaps. And that's an evidence of special creation. Uh, now, you might notice this illustration, this picture that you're looking at looks a little suspect, and yet this is a real animal. This is Tiktaalik. This is a uh, essentially a legged fish, to oversimplify things a little bit. And what I want to point out here is that if you look at uh, the fish fossils and you look at some of these, uh, they're called tetrapod uh, fossils, these sort of four-legged kind of amphibious, uh, amphibious type of animals that were partially aquatic and partially lived on the land, you can see a transition, can't you? I mean, if we're honest... There is similarities between some of these of uh, these animals share features of one animal versus another animal. And so uh, that is significant. The animal we were just talking about, uh, Tiktaalik, is right here in the middle. And he was uh, when he was discovered, he was held up as a great example of the fish to tetrapod transition. Now, spoiler alert, that story got complicated because we've learned that there were trackways made by actual tetrapods. So supposedly Tiktaalik's descendants that show up millions of years earlier in the rock record. So this story is not as simple as this diagram makes it sound. But what I want to point out here is that there are animals that share features from other types of animals. And even in the modern world, there are certain animals that look more like another animal than they do another. And you could put them in an order and you could say that there's some sort of lineage there. And you would be incorrect in the case of the modern animals. But nonetheless, you could do that if you were looking for it. So what I want to argue here is that Evolutionary theory assumes universal common ancestry. So in evolution, all animals are essentially links. They're all related. They're all part of the same family tree. And so in evolution, you could define a missing link as any organism that has a mix of features from two other organisms. And there are animals like this in the fossil record. Um, there's animals like this in the modern world as well, uh, although they don't get pointed to as missing links like the uh, duck-billed platypus. Uh, but in the fossil record, you can find animals like Tiktaalik or Archaeopteryx that seem like they have a mixture of features that you might associate with uh, otherwise unrelated types of animals. Now, what I want to point out is that as creationists, we don't play the same game. We reject universal common ancestry, and we don't believe similarity means that you necessarily evolved from the thing you're similar to. I mean, similarity is kind of a relative term if you think about it. And so... Creationists, we can account for organisms with similar traits because they have a common designer and because God loves diversity and loves to you know, make organisms that kind of uh, are different takes on a similar theme. We see that all throughout uh, the world of biology. So missing links, the, the very phrase, concedes some unnecessary ground, I would argue, to evolution. It's not that it's not wrong. You can find you know, gaps where we're missing the, the critter that should connect these two sequences, these two animals in evolution. Uh, but if we found that animal, does that prove evolution? Not, probably not, actually. It just proves that, you know, there was an animal that had a combination of those features. So, so when we use missing link terminology, we're kind of, we are arguing from ignorance and we're, we're actually leaving a door open for ourselves to be embarrassed by things that we really shouldn't be uh, afraid of because we know that God can create a very wide diversity of animals and that he is not limited to making animals that are extremely different from each other. Although, of course, we, he does that as well. And that's our next topic. Uh, here's a better way to think about the problem for evolution in the fossil record. And that is these two ideas of disparity and diversity. Now, by disparity, what we mean is that uh, it's the range of how different things are from one another. So on the left-hand side here, we have a car, a cactus, a boat, a banana. Uh, I, that's about as dispar uh, dis highest disparity I can imagine. Uh, at least in iconography like this, uh, these things have almost nothing in common. Very high disparity, very low diversity. There's only four of them. There's only one of each type. On the other side, we have very low disparity, a whole bunch of wheeled vehicles, but very high diversity and, and a lot of variations on a theme. 
a lot of different types of vehicles, but you could see how, you know, these vehicles maybe all did descend from a common ancestor, you know, the Model T Ford or, or what have you, uh, the first cars. And so we see a lot of similar traits and we see very low disparity, but very high diversity. Now in evolution, evolution predicts that we begin with simple life forms, very low disparity at the beginning, and then animals become more different from each other as they diversify. So as we get more and more examples of organisms, we, we see them becoming more and more different. That's the evolutionary prediction. Now, from a creation and flood perspective, we would expect very high initial di disparity, just like we have in the modern world. If you were to uh, take an ecosystem in the modern world and just bury it in a flood, uh, you would find plants and you could find reptiles and you could find mammals, a very, very high disparity, very different types of organisms all buried within the same area. Um, and so uh, when we look at the fossil record, what do we see? Well, what we see, and one of the most famous examples here is the Cambrian explosion. We see very high disparity in the fossil record almost from the get-go. In fact, almost all the major animal phyla, which is one of the big taxonomic divisions of, of animals, show up very suddenly all in the Cambrian. And even within individual phylum, there is very high disparity. This is the arthropods, a whole range of very different critters without a real without any direct ancestor that kind of binds them all together there's not a low disparity uh beneath the cambrian that we can say ah okay all the arthropods they came from this guy um instead we just see a whole range of very different types of organisms showing up almost geologically speaking almost overnight uh, and by the way you know uh, paleontologists in, in the secular world they work very hard to stretch the cambrian explosion out to make it more time give it more time uh, I would argue that doesn't solve the problem because there's still we still have high disparity in the Cambrian, even if you extend the amount of time that the the fossils uh, supposedly showed up. And we see this in other parts of the fossil record as well. The Cretaceous with all of our favorite dinosaurs. If we look at the Carboniferous, we see all kinds of plants, very wide, uh, very high disparity uh, and really disparity and diversity are just they, they, they go up together in, in the fossil record. There's not a disparity uh, from diversity, the way that evolution would expect, I'm sorry, uh, low disparity to to uh, increasing with diversity. And, and I know these are big words and maybe a little bit abstract. All I'm describing here is the diagram you guys have all seen, and that is evolution is a tree, a single trunk tree, very low disparity at the base of the tree, right? Just the trunk, one thing. And then as, it, as diversity happens, as more branches come off, then the disparity grows, the morphology grows, the distance between different types of organisms grow. However, in the creation model, uh, we expect very high initial disparity because we believe that these are organisms that God created. Uh, and then we can see diversity. We can see different species, different variations of these organisms. And this is what we often call the creationist orchard. And the fossil record, by and large, comports better with the orchard model than it does with the single evolutionary tree. So that, I believe, is a better argument than arguing about missing links, because missing links, that's kind of a relative term. And, you know, if you find one, it doesn't necessarily prove what you think it does. Uh, I think that disparity and diversity are, are better ways of thinking about the challenge that the fossil record poses to evolution. Now, what about the order of the fossil record? What about the challenge that it poses to, uh, to creationists? Because it does. Um, and that is, why do we find the fossils in particular orders? Why is final succession a real thing? Um, it's not immediately as obvious as maybe the geologic column might be uh, why fossils should show up in particular orders. And of course, uh, the way that the fossil record is taught, we learn the fossil record part and parcel with evolution. And so it's very natural for us to assume that as we go up through the fossil record, we are going up through a sequence of eras of Earth history when certain organisms dominated the world, right? The age of the dinosaurs, the age of the mammals, and so forth. Um, however, that's not the only way to think about the fossil record. Another way in which animals, organisms are divided, even in the modern world, is through ecology. And so we know this, even today, not all organisms that live on Earth at the same time live in the same place. In fact, that's actually very unusual. Maybe, maybe in a very well-equipped zoo, you might have that situation. Uh, but by and large, certain organisms uh, tend to prefer to live near certain kinds of neighbors, certain environments, certain uh, climates, and so forth. And there's a natural segregation that happens in the modern world, simply through ecology. So when we look at the fossil record, can we look at it in terms of ecosystems 
rather than eras. And that's not to deny that there are eras. There, you know, there is a world before the modern world. Uh, but the sequence of different assemblages, different groups of fossil organisms, uh, can we look at them in terms of ecology instead of evolutionary, uh, evolutionary history? And I would argue we can. In fact, when we look at the, the big order sequence in the fossil record, what we tend to find is that the lowest levels of the fossil record are all marine animals. Um, and then it's only as we go higher up in the column that we begin to find animals that lived on the land uh, and even animals that maybe bridge some in the water and some on the land. So the overall sequence that we see is sea to land. Now, that's really interesting because that fits very well with a, the biblical uh, concept of Noah's flood. Noah's flood, if you, if we read the, the text literally, it, it appears to have been a progressive event that transgressed the land. And so when we see, uh, we, so we be, begin with rocks that we believe that, that God probably created uh, during creation week, some primordial uh, material. Um, and then as the flood uh, occurs and progressively advances across the earth, additional layers are added on to our building fossil record. Different ecosystems, different biomes are being overtaken by the floodwaters, and they're ending up in sedimentary layers, packages of layers and fossils that show us the animals and plants that live together in the region where they were uh, where, where they were flooded. And by the way, in the in the flood model, that might not be where they're buried because uh, many fossils show signs of being transported long distances. So. This is uh, something that's called ecological zonation. I'll play that animation again because I wanted to, didn't want to leave the slide just yet. Ecological zonation is a way of understanding some of the more fine-grained orders that we see in the fossil record. Um, one example of the ecological zonation model being used, by the way, uh, was already mentioned uh, by one of our previous speakers, and that is the floating forest theory. Uh, the floating forest theory was based on examining a particular order of fossil plants and th that were buried in marine sediments. This was done by uh, Kurt Wise, a creation paleontologist. And he applied this thinking to this set of organisms that appeared to have an, maybe an evolutionary sequence, uh, if, uh, if you looked at it from that perspective. But he noticed that there were some oddities about this, this record, that there were terrestrial plants in marine ocean sediments, which is not where you expect uh, terrestrial plants to grow. So he developed a theory of a floating forest an ecosystem that existed before the flood with different varieties of plants that exist on the outward edges of the forest and then larger plants and, uh, and even organisms, animals that lived in the larger second, uh, the uh, central uh, uh, portion of this floating forest. Essentially, it's a supersized quaking bog. If you don't know, don't know what that is, Google it. Uh, they're awesome. They're really fun to visit. Um, and that's kind of the environment that uh, Dr. Wise proposed to explain this particular sequence of plant fossils. Now, by the way, not all creationists hold to the floating forest model. There's some debate about it. Nonetheless, it is an example of uh, seeing a sequence, a real sequence in the fossil record, and then applying eco eco ecology, excuse me, ecological zonation to explain that sequence instead of simply assuming that it represents the evolution of plants, for example. And the floating forest theory is very successful in terms of explaining more than just the order of the plant fossils, it also explains why they're in the ocean, why we have land plants and even some land animals, uh, or at least semi-aquatic animals, in the ocean where they wouldn't normally live, you would think, uh, looking at the modern world. All right, a couple more I, uh, things from the fossil record uh, that I think are, are helpful for us as creationists. One is the exceptional preservation of fossils. Uh, we've all seen fossils of fish eating other fish and so forth. Lots of examples in the fossil record of rapid burial. Uh, and not just rapid burial, but beautiful preservation. And I want to stress this. That is really surprising. Uh, even The fossilization itself is extremely rare in the modern world. Uh, to the degree it happens at all, you're not going to see great preservation because we have scavengers and we have bacteria and all kinds of organisms and processes that will tend to break down deceased critters and they don't last very long, certainly not long enough to preserve, in some cases, the stomach contents of an individual animal. So the fossil record shows evidence of very unusual circumstances in the Earth's past and likely very catastrophic circumstances. And as in terms of preservation, one of my favorite examples of this is the trilobites. Um, the trilobites are 
found uh, in the very lowest layers of the geologic column, the fossil record. And, and trilobites had apparently a form of compound eye that gave them exceptional abilities in terms of their vision and their optics. Um, and we're able, scientists are actually able to, uh, these are preserved so well, we can actually, at a detailed level, analyze these things and, and see how they saw the world, uh, which is mind blowing, the like level of preservation. I mean, it would, you would think that we'd be you know, very fortunate to preserve any remnant of an animal like a trilobite. And instead, not, do we have, not only do we have many of them, but they are exceptionally well preserved. Another example of, of catastrophic processes uh, that uh, seem to be evidenced in the fossil record is this phenomenon of trackways. So fossils aren't always just animal bones, animal body parts. Sometimes we find their footprints, their trackways. And there's an odd uh, pattern that we find with many animals where we, we tend to find their trackways at a lower level in the fossil record, in the geologic column, than we find the body fossils of the organisms. Almost as though there was one point in history when these animals were alive and running around and we preserved their trackways, but they somehow survived and only at a later level did they finally become buried and become part of a fossil record. That is not a situation that is very easily explained in the uniformitarian uh, understanding of the fossil record. You'd expect to find the trackways and the fossils and all the evidences of these organisms living and dying all in the same formations because they lived and did, did those things at the same time. And to be clear, we do. there are cases where we find that. Nonetheless, we also have these unusual cases where there do seem to be these large gaps. And uh, the, the link there at the bottom of the slide uh, will give you a little more information on these examples in particular. This goes back to a point that I made in the, in the last talk, which is that like the geologic column, the fossil record shows us that Earth history is linear and not cyclical. Now, in this case, evolution would also argue that Earth history is linear, to be fair, although you know, that's not the way their first uniformitarians argued. They believed uh, that uh, organisms would come back and maintain the status quo. Uh, but uh, my, my point here is that the present, again, is not the key to the past. The Earth that we see in the fossil record is very different from the Earth that we see today. And in fact, what it seems, what seems to be the case is that we see in the fossil record the remains of a lost world that was catastrophically destroyed, just as Cuvier uh, said in our, uh, the quote we read earlier. The fossil record then is a record of progressive ecological destruction, not evolution. And we have to remind ourselves of that. When we look at the fossil record, we're not seeing a record of life. We're seeing a record of death. And that, that needs to be factored in. We, we sometimes, or certainly in evolutionary circles, and sometimes we adopt it by habit, uh, we look at the fossil record as a record of life on Earth. I may have even said that in this talk because it's so, so ubiquitous. Um, but it's actually a record of, of life's demise through Earth history and in very catastrophic, violent ways in many cases. And with many features, I've only mentioned a couple of them today, that are very unusual when we look at the modern world and how animals die and are preserved, if at all. So how should creationists think about the fossil record? Uh, this picture in the backdrop here is actually a fossil dig run by young earth creationists uh, from Loma Linda University. This is active original creationist research in dinosaur fossils that is ongoing. Uh, very exciting to see that. There's a lot of up and coming creation paleontologists in the community that are looking at these issues really closely. And the points I want to bring out again are the fossil record is real. It's a real phenomenon. Uh, it is not dependent on evolution, even though it is usually taught in terms of evolution. And evolution is an explanation in one sense. It is a story we can tell from the fossil record, but it's not necessarily the only story or even the best story. The Earth, Earth history, again, is linear. The present is not the key to the past. Again, evolution would say something similar in this, in this particular example. Uh, but when we look at the Bible, we look at the, the, uh, the storyline that we have in Scripture of uh, supernatural creation, of, of a biosphere of animals that, are, that become corrupt in some way, according to Genesis 6. All flesh corrupt it, corrupts itself uh, following the fall. Uh, and so when we look at the fossil record, we're not seeing animals necessarily the way that God created them. We're seeing them at the point in which God said enough is enough. And that's something I think is very important to bear in mind because we see many examples of disease, of cannibalism, and of suffering in the fossil record. 
So we're looking at the record of a world that perished, a world that had gotten so out of hand that God determined that it had to be destroyed in order for life to continue. Um, and then, of course, we have the time after the flood, the, the world that we live in today, which theologically the Bible describes as a different world than the world that was before the flood. And that is certainly what we see in the fossil record. So a few more takeaways as we end this session. Uh, the presentation the fossil record gives us a window into that world that perished at the time of noah's flood as well as the recovery leading uh following after the flood which is something that creationists sometimes overlook that uh that there are changes in the fossil record as we get to those upper layers that kind of blend us into the the world we live in today and that would likely be a post-flood phenomenon the organisms in the fossil record show great initial disparity they're very different they're very distinct from one another uh, we see abrupt appearance, as Cuvier uh, described, uh, and we see stasis. We don't see individual uh, species going through a whole sequence of changes for the most part. There are certain sequences that we can talk about. The floating forest model was a is a theory to explain some of those transitions. Excuse me. In general, I would argue this supports a creation and flood model. It's not to say there's no problems. It's not to say there's no uh, areas that require further research and, and rethinking. And these models that we're talking about could be wrong, as we said in the last presentation. Nonetheless, in general, I think we're on solid ground when we say that the fossil record supports a record of creation and the flood. And so I would argue that creationists should, as, as they are currently, uh, interpret the fossil record in terms of biblical history. Creation, uh, the world between the, the fall and the flood, the flood itself being the driving factor again in producing the fossil record, and then the post-flood recovery. Uh, the main resource I want to recommend here is a book by one of our previous speakers, uh, Paul Garner, Fossils and the Flood, Exploring Lost Worlds with Science and Scripture. A beautiful book, beautiful illustrations and dioramas from a young earth creation perspective. Uh, and there's a mixture of technical information as well as beautiful pictures. So it's a very approachable book, and I highly recommend it. It is the most up-to-date resource in creation circles that I'm aware of, specifically on the issue of the fossil record. And then uh, these uh, resources that I referenced in the last talk are applicable here as well. They will also deal with the fossil record, uh, but to, with uh, less detail. And that is my presentation. So I thank you for your time. Again, my contact information is right here. If you have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to entertain them. And Paul, back to you. Thank you so much. That was an excellent and uh, informative session, Zachary. Uh, one quick question. So every now and then I hear some creationists that uh, whenever they come across a fossil, they automatically assume that it is a fossil from the flood. Is that a valid assumption or is it one that should be modified? Well, if we think about it biblically, it's it's not a biblical assumption. The only biblical thing we can say about fossils, animal fossils in particular, uh, is that uh, they are post fall because we believe that the fall brought was the, it brought on the, the entrance of death into the world. Um, but the Bible doesn't tell us that fossils were made during the flood at all. And in fact, some very early creationists, um, well, I shouldn't say early, there's some that still hold this view, um, but it was more popular um, some decades ago, uh, believe that no fossils were preserved during the flood, that the flood blotted out life entirely. And that seems to be a bridge too far, both uh, biblically and scientifically. Um, nonetheless, there are certain fossils, certain fossil ecosystems that we see in the fossil record that appear to not be from the flood. And this is an area that becomes controversial and not all creationists are on the same page on this. But similar to the geologic column, as we get to those last few layers where deposits start to become a little bit more localized and begin to resemble more of the, the river drainages and the lake systems that we see today, something similar happens with the fossil record in those upper strata. And so, so there is a point, even though if we can't quite agree on where it is in every point along the world, in, in the earth, and it may be different in different places, there is going to be a point where we see that transition from the world that then was to the world we live in today, where we begin to find the fossils of animals that came off the ark, that escaped the flood, and they're going to look different from the animals that were buried immediately below them because there's no direct relationship between them. They didn't live in the same places before the flood. And so that transition, wherever you find it, uh, you're going to start to find fossils that were buried catastrophically, very rapidly. We're still not talking about gradualism uh, because we believe that there were there, there still are catastrophes that happen today. And there were probably even more so in the immediate post-flood period. 
So it's not as simple as every fossil is from the flood. It is safe to say that fossils in general are evidence of rapid catastrophe, rapid burial. And mo we believe most of that would have taken place during the Noah's flood, but it certainly could have happened in the centuries uh, following and even today in very limited extents. All right, thank you so much. This has been uh, Zachary Klein, independent research and researcher and creation speaker for the Missouri Association for Creation, speaking on the understanding of the fossil record. Thank you so much.